two of the joys of being a member of the Alpine Garden Society are that firstly you start growing plants that might surprise your neighbours and secondly that you learn some new words that will tell you a little more about the plants and how to grow them. What I want to do in this short lecture is to introduce you to the plant that distinguishes our house's grass bird from those of its neighbours. I've just been showing you some spring flowering daffodils. The plant I want to show you is often called an autumn daffodil in contrast to the spring daffodils and I'll tell you more about it and where you can find it in the wild in a moment. And the word? Well, as you saw, the word is geophyte and geophyte is the word. Very likely you have already many geophytes in your garden. You've just seen some, but it just helps to clarify what you know already, but might not know you know. Like so many people in the UK, I've planted a selection of daffodils on the grass verge between our house and the road. This is what it looks like in the spring. It turns into a wildflower meadow during the summer, but in the autumn there's another transition. These are what I called autumn daffodils, and in a way they are. They're in the same family as daffodils, but a different genus that is found in the wild around the Mediterranean. Mine were brought from a nursery, of course, although to be honest I will wonder a bit why people need to pay so much money for them. I bought a small number, planted them in a small flower bed, and they multiplied so much that I soon had enough to plant out across quite a deep grass verge. This is Sternbergia lutea. I'll say a bit more about it in a moment. Uh, but first, let's answer the question, what is a geophyte? Actually, it is something that is common to all the plants I've shown you, and more. During a part of the year when the conditions get too tough for them, they retreat underground. Most gardeners have perennial plants that die down in the winter when it is cold and frosty, uh, but in some regions, and the Mediterranean is one of them, the challenge in time is during the summer when the ground gets baked hard and dry. Unlike our herbaceous garden plants, it's too hot for any of the plant to be near the surface, uh, so there aren't even uh, growing shoots at the surface. Uh, so they, com they retreat completely underground. They're commonly referred to as bulbs, but technically the underground storage organ organism can take one of a number of different forms, bulbs, corms and rhizomes. However, the important point is that the summer is the dormancy period and they can become active again when it cools down and rains in the autumn. Then there is the choice of flowering in the autumn before the winter sets in, as with the Sternbergia, or in the spring once the snow and cold retreat, as the, with the more commonly grown daffodils. There are two things to learn from this. Firstly, there is a feast of flowers to see in the Mediterranean in the autumn, and secondly, this provides an abundance of ideas of plants to search out from nurseries to provide autumn colour in the garden. Let's take a quick look at one place where these autumn beauties can be found. There are many more. The lower part of Greece, almost separated from the northern part of Greece by the Gulf of Corinth, is the Peloponnese. There's a feast of autumn bulbs to be found here, but we'll take a look just on the northern side of the Gulf of Corinth. The ancient site of Delphi is a fantastic archaeological site, but is also rich in plants. We'll take a look at Sternbergia there, and then move on towards the Mount Parnassos to see a few more geophytes to give you a little bit of a feel for the variety. So, this is the home of the Delphic Oracle. In the middle distance, this is some columns marking the Temple of Apollo. Turning around, there are some stunning views down to the Gulf of Corinth, and all around are clusters of Sternbergia. Uh, this is, again, Sternbergia lutea. If you look closely, just below the yellow flower is a green swelling that is the ovary. If you look at a daffodil, you'll see the same structure, which is one characteristic that identifies them both as being in the same family. Uh, technically, Amaryllidaceae. As I've mentioned, Sternbergia lutea makes for a very pretty, for a pretty tough it is very pretty too, for a pretty tough garden plant, but there are plenty more geophytes to be seen, and many of them can be, provide garden interest if you can provide them with a little more care. Let's move up the lower slopes of Mount Parnassus to see a few more examples. You've heard of autumn crocuses, which are in fact colticums, as you may know. However, there are many actual crocuses that flower in the autumn. This is Crocus hadriaticus, subspecies hadriaticus. It's a 
very beautiful little plant, but not one that is readily available commercially, unfortunately. There are other species, however, that are available, so do look out for them. If you're paying attention, you would have noticed the Sternbergia had six stamens. The crocus, however, has three. It's in a different family, Iridaceae, uh, the Iris family. Notice also that this crocus has a vivid red style that is divided into three filaments. The variations in the style from species to species is fascinating, and one of the little details that brings added delight for the attentive. Note the delicate feathering also on the outside and inside of the tepals on this one. Uh, this is Crocus cancellatus subspecies Mazaricus. I must apologise for the use of Latin names, but from looking at this, you'll appreciate the significant differences between, between crocuses. And systematic naming is the only way to be sure of identifying a specific plant correctly. I did mention that in gardens we often refer to colchicums as autumn crocuses, so it's natural to expect to see colchicums in the wild that flower in the autumn, and that is indeed the case. This is Colchicum, Colchicum cupani, rather a small plant compared with the varieties that are typically grown in the garden, but a delight to see in the wild nevertheless. Uh, the black stamens are a distinct feature of this species, but notice also that it has six of them to clearly differentiate it from a true crocus. Colchicum used to be classified as part of the lily family, but is now separated off into a family of 15 genera, character characterised by the presence of colchicine, an important anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, but do be warned that in high doses it is toxic to humans, so don't try eating colchicums. Uh, Colchicum cupani occurs quite widely through Greece, Italy, France, and across the Mediterranean to Algeria and Tunisia. Moving a bit higher up Parnassus to about 1800 metres above sea level, we can find uh, Colchicum boissieri. This is a more limited distribution restricted to Greece and Turkey. There are more geophytes to be seen, but this has introduced three of the main autumn flowering genera. So remember, if it has three stamens, it's a crocus. If it has six, as here, it's a colchicum, unless, of course, it's a Sternbergia. Um, but, of course, you can tell a Sternbergia from a colchicum by the ovary at the base of the corolla, uh, just like you see in daffodils. So that wraps up this introductory talk. There is, of course, much, much more to be seen in the autumn across Greece and Balkans, but hopefully this is A, whetted your appetite to see more, and B, help you to recognise a geophyte when you see one. Thank you.